I think you you can have a decent amount of complexity there because it just reflects the complexity of your problem that isn't going to go away anyway. And it's good to keep also the middle layers uh, reasonable and not too complicated and not try to, to baby and try to, to uh, pander too much to your user code and treat it like a helpless baby because also the user code can deal with some complexity. So that's, that's the, the direction in which I'm currently leaning, which in my case is easy because in, in my case, I'm writing all the layers. So I would only be shifting complexity to myself from one hand to the other, so to say. So I do not have to fight any battles over that. In a company it might be very different. Uh, you might have to fight lots of battles if you want to shift complexity from one part to the other. <clears throat> so yeah, that was my general considerations consideration here. Explain actually I have I think I have explained all the functions that are currently in the interface in, in the interface. Uh, we will need to change a bit about these functions. For example, that the backwards parsing is now implemented in a suboptimal way that I want to change. The peak function, we will need to talk about whether we need something like this. So it's a, look, a kind of look ahead mechanic if we want to have something like this at all because it's quite complicated. Yeah. Otherwise, I think I've talked about everything that is in the abstract interface. I will take a break. And then we will probably go into some detailed contracts for, the, for these functions in the interface. What are the actual contracts between them, the stream implementation and the user code? So in the previous part of the design review, we mostly uh, post a lot of questions, many more than the decisions we actually made. So let's see whether we can already answer some of the open questions. Maybe we can even if we cannot definitely answer them, we can discuss some options. So do we want explicit end of file, beginning of file data members? Um, yeah, either yes or no. In the case that we do not want them, we would probably just use the condition if the buff and the end pointer of a stream are identical, this means that we do not have any data, any accessible data in the buffer. So this condition would be uh, used as the end of file or beginning of file condition after, after the fetch has returned. Now, could this work? It depends a bit, I think, also on the kind of streams we will be working on because there could be streams that do not that are not able to provide even a single byte although the stream has not yet ended there, there could be for example network streams that so if a network network connection <coughs> is still open but cannot provide any data right now, 
And then we would have this condition maybe that if, if we, so if we do not block, we could have this ambiguous condition where we have no data in the buffer, but the stream is still open. I'm currently not planning to have streams like that. But it's something to consider. So that's a possible a possible con. Um, we cannot distinguish between uh, no data available yet and end of data. Currently, it's not a problem because currently the fetch function is defined such that it, if there's any possibility that further data is available, it must never return with buff and end equal. If, if we say yes, um, then a definite counter argument is counter argument is is the, that this complicates the handling of random access because the the end of stream or beginning of stream condition can actually go away once we do a seek and then we will have difficult cases so if the seek hits exactly the end of the hits exactly the end of the stream do we already do we want to set the, the end of file condition and, and so on so this complicates random access streams to some degree. One thing that is that might be a problem here is that this condition actually also exists when we have yielded a substream. Because then it has no data buffer and both of these are zero. So possible confusion with yielded substreams is uh, one counter argument here. Pro is of course the smaller interface. We maybe should later take a look at the code where we currently use the end of file marker and how this would look like if we were to use this condition instead or a function checking this condition. So this we can, we can always wrap this in an inline function. So let's take a look at the next one. So if we say yes, we want to Marcus, do we use different ones for beginning and end of file? Well, again, it's it's a bit similar to the first question because. The problem here is not the random access so much, but switching parsing directions. And the problem is uh, 
if we don't so let's say that the options are separate and B we use the same if we use the same this could become ugly if we want to switch passing direction especially if we want to switch passing direction without calling a function on the, at the, at the interface <laughs> this may cause problems when we switch passing direction especially if we switch without calling a function interface um, and this is we probably want to switch I probably we want to switch without passing a function because I don't really want to make the interface stateful with regard to passing the direction. Uh, that's actually another good design question. So should uh, the abstract data stream Be aware of the current passing direction. And I think, and I think, I think it shouldn't be aware of that because it's a, it adds complicated state to the data stream. We should rather handle it by having the different fetch and fetch backwards functions. Also because backwards parsing is really a strange case that we don't do a lot, we only do it Currently, we only do it for finding the cross-reference info in the PDF file. So I think I think this this can be answered with no. We do not want to um, complicate the stream state. We also do not want to overload uh, the interface functions for both directions. I think this would just make us unhappy a lot. Because also I think we probably not all streams we want to support the backwards direction and also the backwards direction should not mix too much into the the forward direction i think we really want to keep them as, as using separate function calls So I think if we if we want to have two markers, we want to have separate markers. There's also another con another con 
to the end of file, beginning of file data members, because um, because hmm i'm just thinking both both have <coughs> I think I can come up with a counter argument to both of the options. <coughs> because here we have the problem that if, um, if the user code rewinds the stream pointer, so the pointer for the current position, then the EOF or, or beginning of file members would become invalid. That's not nice. So we would probably have to combine this anyway by setting, by setting buff and end to the same pointer thereby avoiding that the user code can get away from the end or beginning in this way without calling a fetch or fetch or seek or something like that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I'm currently leaning towards the second option so let's actually three pluses is too strong. I think I'm uh, I'm leaning towards this direction. So a uh, passing direction. I think this we can add as a as a decision. Okay, so let's look at the at the interface functions in detail. First, fetch and fetch backwards. Um, currently, they have the following precondition. Actually, I need to separate them. Currently, fetch has the following precondition that, that the pointer must be set to the end of the buffer data before we call fetch. And this makes things 
This makes things much easier because it means that the fetch implementation can throw away all the buffered data because it knows that there is no data in front of the current position that needs to be preserved. So that turned out for me to be a helpful precondition. And there is a bit of a downside to that that has to do with the look ahead functionality that we have not yet discussed. But currently this um, Currently, I'm happy with that precondition. A post condition is either no more data available and as pointer equals s end or s pointer is strictly smaller than the end pointer. Uh, do we want to say something about the buffer point the, the, the pointer to begin to the beginning of the buffer in this contract? I'm not sure. I mean the no more data available. We could also call this simply uh, end of stream reached. How is it for the backwards? Currently backwards parsing is a mess in my implementation, but I would like to make this a reasonable mirror image of the forward direction. So the precondition would be the pointer must be equal to the buffer start. Uh, this is also something, so we should formulate this as an invariant that the bytes from from S point to C, um, dereferenced until one before the end pointer so um, Let's say, let's formulate the invariant more clearly. So the invariant is that S pointer is strictly less than S end. Implies that the bytes from S pointer dereferenced to one before the end pointer are valid data. Our valid data um, to be consumed by forward passing. 
also we can say that if s booth is smaller than s pointer then the bytes from s buff to s pointer minus one are valid data to be consumed by backward parsing and that's much cleaner than what i have currently because i made a mistake uh, initially that i did backwards parsing by using the end pointer as the running pointer and that was a mistake i think and this is much cleaner because you see also that this or this were this invariant also splits the data cleanly into two parts that do not overlap and they are adjacent so you have until s pointer indexed so subscripted minus one you have the the data that comes when you do backward parsing and then starting with the next byte you have the data for forward parsing so they are cleanly um, touching each other but not overlapping And by moving pointer, both both um, ranges are automatically correctly adapted. That is nice, I think. We cannot really say something about the so. Another invariant is also that we always, at all times, we must have this. So the ordering of the pointers, even if they are null pointers, even if they are null pointers, they must all be ordered like this, always. Also, we have the invariant that either they are all null pointers or none of them is. So we can write this in the following way that not s buff equals not s pointer equals not s end. I think now I'm remembering one of the downsides of not, not having a maybe but maybe it's not a big downside of, of not having a separate um, end of file data member because But actually, I think it's a complexity that we just have. I mean, the, the, the downside is that you can reach the end and you try to fetch and then you get back this condition that tells you that you have hit the end. But then if you try to do something again on the stream, it again you again cannot tell whether you really are at the end. You've already hit end of file or you're seeing that for the first time. You really cannot tell without remembering that somehow. But I'm not even sure if that is actually a counter argument because it's also an advantage that you, you have less state that can become inconsistent with the rest of the world because the main problem with the end of file 
if you store it as a state in the interface, the, the main problem is that it can become invalidated by various operations. So maybe it's even a good thing if you if you want data that you try to fetch again. It could even be a good thing. So I'm not even sure if that is a pro or a con. So user code may repeatedly try to fetch data at the end of stream. That has both negative and positive aspects. I mean, most of the user code will be written in a way that it immediately gives up if it does not get any more data and will not, will not intentionally or accidentally retry. So let's see, can we mirror this? So beginning of stream reached and as pointer equals as buff or as pointer is strictly larger than as buff. What about the other functions? Seek. So I think seek is a very seek is a very simple function from the point of the contract because there aren't really any preconditions to seeking a position in the stream, I think. And post conditions actually, I mean, what we would like to have is that a post condition is, is, is the data stream pos returns the position that we that we seek to right so <clears throat> no but uh, actually we do not have that because that's that would actually be data stream relative pos a function that does not currently exist yet but that I plan to add because there are two ways that you can understand positions one is with respect to the most underlying parent stream like the file for example and the other is um, relative to the beginning of the particular substream that you're in and seeking is always relative to the substream. But the, the position returned by data stream pos is actually currently, and I think I will keep it that way, is actually with reference to the most underlying stream. This is that is one design question actually to how should data stream pos report the current position so relative to the innermost substream and relative to the 
so beginning of the beginning of the outermost or the most underlying parent stream. I think B has the big con, uh, sorry, the big pro argument. This is more useful to the end user and developer in error reports. So I want to have this uh, position relative to the most underlying stream as typically what is reported in error messages. Maybe with some, as I have now already, with some extra information about the, the nested streams. Also, I think it turned out so far in my work that this makes this makes the implementation of substreams actually easier. I think it made it easier. I think that was, it's hard to tell what, so up, a priori, it would be hard to tell which one makes it easier, but my experience with the code base now that I'm working on here is that actually option B is easier to handle for the substream implementations because the point is because they share this, they share the same buffer with the parent stream and so they can also share the offset data member. The sharing actually can means they it's, it's not really shared it's it's duplicated. So they have the same value, the S offset value is the same, is the same in the parent and the child as long as the child has not yielded when they two can detach from each other. Of course, an interesting question for seek is always what, what should happen if you seek to an invalid position that is beyond the end of the stream? We cannot actually, we cannot seek before the beginning because seek, we use um, an unsigned offset that is always unsigned offset uh, from the beginning of the stream. So we never can see, but uh, actually, yeah, yeah, because this is always substream relative, so. and unsigned so it can never go it can never go before the beginning of the of the substream and therefore also not of the parent stream but it could go it could go beyond the end of either so it could go beyond the end of both of these so the question is what should happen then should we should we fail immediately or should we fail only when we try to fetch? Should we guarantee the failing or not? I think it will make implementation more difficult if we guarantee an immediate fail. So this is, um, th these are actually the post conditions for the non-failure case. 
because you can always have a failure to fetch. And then I don't know if we should guarantee something about the buffer pointers, except those those invariants. We always want to we always want to guarantee those invariants, but we may not we may not want to guarantee more than that. So those are uh, general invariants that hold should hold at all times from an initialized data stream. So, I mean, that's sorry. That's that's for non-failure, but we do not really want to say something about whether we whether we guarantee immediate failure on an invalid C. So that that's a bit open. So note. I'm seeking a position beyond the end of this substream. It is not guaranteed that seek will immediately fail. I'm not I'm not completely sure about that so that's another design question to clarify um, how to handle seeking beyond the end of the substream so multiple options always fail immediately B would be never fail immediately, only fail if data is fetched at the invalid position. And C would be um, may fail but not guaranteed to fail immediately. So many questions. Maybe we can make some progress on another function. Yeah, for advanced there also, I mean, could also be interesting questions. I think for yield we really we could formulate the post condition but I do not want to because it could really be a no op that does nothing and then only only the invariants are guaranteed. So I think we will just say for, for yield no pre post conditions except general invariants the 
the fail context function will probably change to a report context function. This also should have no, no particular pre and post conditions. The advanced function has similar questions associated with it as the seek function because it is quite different to seek. It's just a bit simpler because we can only seek in, we can only advance in the forward direction. We could ask for some guarantees, but that's also similar to seek. We could ask for some guarantees that if the if the advance can be satisfied within the current stream buffer that it should not invalidate the buffer but i'm not sure whether i want to make this kind of guarantee i don't think i want to because if the user code if the user code wants to have such a guarantee it should really deal with the pointers itself because as i mentioned in the first part of the stream the user code is so the user code is allowed to manipulate the current buffer pointer And so it can do seek and advance within the buffer as much, much as it wants, and then this is this is guaranteed. So this is something we can write down immediately as a decision, actually. So the advance function. Uh, and the seek function do not guarantee to um, keep the buffer valid even if the requested seek advance can be satisfied within the current buffer. They do not guarantee. That does not mean that they shouldn't actually keep the buffer. They will if they are, if they are nice implementations. So no implementations. We're probably try to keep the buffer but user code should not depend on it if the user code wants such guarantees it should really uh, manipulate as pointer by itself But for, for implementation, we actually want to do it without throwing the buffer away. Because one, one goal for the implementation is that if the whole file is in the, in the stream buffer, we never throw the buffer away. So that's, that's an implementation goal that we can write down. So if the stream buffer contains the whole stream, the buffer should never be invalidated.
all random access functions should be satisfied while keeping the buffer valid. <clears throat> That's certainly something worthy a worthy goal to achieve. But it's not the same thing as guaranteeing it to the user code that this is going to happen. So this will become report context fn. We still need to think a bit about that. Yeah. The, the big question mark here is the peak function. And what this actually does but the idea of this was that this is a function that takes a size, so a number of bytes, and it tries to guarantee, if at all possible, that the following n bytes after the current location in the stream should be visible in the buffer, if it is at all possible. And this, uh, this is already difficult because it's only possible if at least two conditions hold. One is that the data is actually there, so that we still have at least n bytes until the end of stream. And the second condition is that the buffer can be made large enough. And then the question is, what do we do if we still have some, some data that is valid left in the buffer, but we want to peak farther than that. Do we then reread the whole thing or do we move the part that we have and then fetch afterwards and so and it gets really complicated. I think there's currently only a single instance where I, I, where I use the peak function. Yeah, there's only one. And I think it's not a very strong use case. Because here I only look ahead three characters and I do it to simplify the code for passing a hexadecimal hexadecimal byte in the PDF stream. That's really not a strong use case because if you want to make parsing hex bytes fast, you really should look into parsing larger chunks of them at once and not, not byte by byte. So, so that's, really not, that's really not a strong use case. And I think that's the only one currently where I use this look ahead functionality. I mean, not that, that the look ahead could not become extremely useful in some cases, but currently I don't really have much use for it. So I think for now the decision will be to remove this function, which opens so many questions and, and this potentially difficult to implement. The good thing is we can always add this function later, I think, because it doesn't really change the interface fundamentally. It's just an additional service provided by the stream that it can do this this look ahead um,
<clears throat> so I think, yeah, yeah, we will, I will remove this. So, I don't, for something complicated like that, that can make a lot of things more involved, I really would like to have a very strong, clear use case first, before I add that. Uh, so for advance, I think advance is really, really quite similar to seek. It's like the little brother of seek, right? The, the main difference is that streams that are not fully random access so even streams that do not really support full random access might support advance. From the user code point of view, they're otherwise really quite similar. So I think we could say that uh, from user perspective, advance by offset is very similar to seek data pause relative position and uh, data stream of course data stream relative position plus plus offset it's very similar to that So therefore we could just say see seek here for post condition. It is certainly not more problematic than seek, but maybe also not much less because in the forward direction we have this case of uh, advancing beyond the end of the stream and we don't know should we should we guarantee to fail immediately or not. For the report context function, what we're interesting the interesting thing will be how to how to handle the output. Should we pass a callback, for example? So that's another question on how to handle the output produced by report context function. Either we could provide a, a print of like callback, for example, to the function. provide a pre-allocated buffer to the function. We could have the function allocate, but I don't want it. So I generally, for, for low level stuff like this, I generally want to avoid allocations inside the functions. I want to really take care of the memory management at higher levels.
Yeah, maybe the even the more interesting, um, the more interesting question is how to hem how to report context of nested streams to report context clearly in the case of multiple nested substreams. And this is something to think about. Actually, today is just question collection time. It's not, not really a, what you would expect from a review, would you? To, but I mean, it's there's no point in fooling ourselves. So to pretend that we have everything covered and decided. And actually, there are lots of questions like these. It's amazing how such a simple subsystem can, can pose all these questions. I mean, it's not, not too bad because we actually have a working subsystem in place. It's just showing some already some signs of age. So <laughs> even though it's only I don't know, two weeks old or so. It was the first thing that came to mind. And now it's already becoming obvious that it has some, and mo mostly it's working just fine. It, it just has some weak spots, like the backwards parsing was awkwardly implemented. And many of the, of the detailed questions that I, come, uh, that I come up with now, they are just not answered clearly by this present system. So actually we have decided here about the peak lookahead interface. We currently don't want any of that complexity. Yeah, get non-fail context reporting for debug warnings. Uh, this needs some interface design. Just, but otherwise we know we want to have that. Yeah, this I already noted down. Bit sources are the remaining large topic, maybe not that large. So this is just about what we need. So as I said, data streams are, in our context here, data streams are just sequences of bytes. Now the problem is, how do we handle code that ne doesn't need sequences of bytes, but sequences of individual bits? like the Huffman, um, the Huffman decoding uh, for JBIG2. And the way I currently handle this is not directly in the data stream itself, but I have something, I have something that I call a data stream bit source, I think. It's very simple, it's just, just two, two data members, a bit reservoir and a number of available bits. And then there are some inline functions. Actually, I should change them to force inline. Start and finish are not so critical, but the, the shift and the peak, they should definitely be force inline. So the idea here is that this bit source uh, is a thin layer on top of a data stream and it guarantees a certain amount of limited look ahead. Currently that is eight bits. So what the data stream bit source guarantees to you as the user code is that if there are at least eight bits remaining, then you can see them currently by looking at the most significant bits of the reservoir. The problem is, 
currently the data stream bit source behaves like it could always provide this look ahead. The problem is, in reality, it can only provide the 8-bit look ahead if it has not yet hit the end of the stream because there might just not be eight further pits, bits. And the question is how to handle this case. Because you really want to, the, the, the bit look ahead should be very, very fast. You, you don't really want to have branches in, in this bit look ahead because that's just, that would kill your decoding speed. And so we, we should probably settle on something like this that the reservoir will always provide bits, but if, if the bits are beyond the end of the stream, you will just get zeros, for example, in the, in the look ahead. And if you then need to check whether the bits are really there or not, you, you need to look at the number of available bits. Currently, this is very awkwardly defined because currently the, the unavail data member actually stores the number of available bits minus eight because it currently the data stream acts like at least eight would always be available, which is not really true, and which is causing the problems in the in the remaining failing tests with the conformance data that I have. So we should really change this to a proper. So this we should remove. I don't know how to. That's awkward. I don't. <laughs> don't know how to write awkward because it has such awkward spelling. Um, remove this. Um, it is defined in a way that does not play well with end of stream. And we should instead have something like <coughs> and available bits that, so I will use this also to clean up the name and this will make our compiler find all the instances of this. Uh, to have something like this, and that actually is the true number of available bits and it can be less than eight if we are at can be less than eight if we are at end of stream. Uh, the next question is, so the lower bound for this will be zero. What is the upper bound? I mean, 16 clearly because the reservoir is only 16 bits. We could make this larger, but we actually guarantee only eight bits if, if we have available data. And so there's not much point in making this larger. The question is, can it actually be 16? Because 16 would mean that we have fetched a byte earlier than necessary. Because if we had 16, it means that even without the latest byte that we fetched, we would have eight bits look ahead. And that's what we guarantee. So I think that I think what we probably want here is that this is always less than 16. The reason, there's a, there's a particular reason why we do not want to fetch more bytes than necessary. I mean, 
usually it would be nice to have it as much look at it as possible, right? So it would be nice to have more, more bytes already in the reservoir. The problem is with putting the bytes back at the end when we are done using the data stream bit source. Because Because if we have not used up at least one bit from a byte, so we have used zero bits of the byte, then we will actually, at the end, when we are done using the bit source, we want to put back this um, over eagerly fetched byte that we did not really consume any bit of. We want to push that back into the data stream. And we only ever can reliably push, uh, put back a, sim, a single byte, at least without seeking and stuff like that. So without seeking, just with data buffer, just with data buffer manipulations, we can only put back safely a single byte ever. And the reason for that is that the fetch function only guarantees that if there is data available at all, it will, it will at, least, at least provide one byte. So if we have fetched data su successfully and if we could put a byte into the data stream bits or the reservoir, we know that we have at least this uh, space for at least this one byte in the buffer. And we can just put it back by just decrementing the, the point of the data stream. So that is a bit of a complicated topic, but I think we can write this as a design decision that for a bit source with 8-bit look ahead at all times we shall have So we can have zero available bits if we really consumed everything up to end of stream. This will always be strictly less than 16. So the rationale, rationale is that less than 16 guarantees that there is at most one completely unconsumed byte in the bit source reservoir that needs to be put back into its data stream. Yeah, because 16 would be the first number that divided by 8 is 2. So, yeah, 16 would be the first number where we have two unconsumed bytes. The partially consumed bytes we never put back in the data stream. At least currently we don't have a case where we would have to put the partially consumed byte back.
uh, let's take a bit more look at the, at the data stream. So um, the Yeah, and it will be at least eight if you are not at end of stream. And those those available bits will always be the MSBs of the reservoir. So let's see how this would look like. Um, Yeah, here we should already deal with here we should already deal with end of stream. Although Although maybe for starting it's okay if we don't if we don't want to have a valid case where we start right at the end of the stream with zero bits ahead, I think it should be fine what we do. The only thing that that is not is not fine, so this will be removed, and what we will do here is to set n available bits to eight, not to zero. That will be the new code. Finish. This is actually a huge mess currently. This is really, really a huge mess. That is sometimes we put back two bytes, which is not reliably possible. So this is a huge, huge, huge mess. This is one of the main reasons for me for cleaning up the bit sources, that this is really not good what is happening here. So this is the, this is currently what we, what we use, but How would this look like in a, if it's sane? So if it's sane, we would say if the number of available bits is at least eight, this means we have at least one unconsumed byte and we know that we don't have two. So we have exactly one. We have exactly one unconsumed byte. one fully um, consumed byte in the reservoir. Then we, we can simply decrement the pointer in the stream because we simply put back one byte. And here actually we can assert, so we only are allowed to do that if the buffer strat is strictly less than, than the pointer, because then afterwards we will have less than or equal. And this is guaranteed if we did not mess with the data stream in between. So that's important that whenever we work with a bit source, we are not allowed to yield the data stream and we are not allowed to mess around with it in any other way until we finish the, the bit source using this function.
Yeah, so that, that is the clean, the clean variant. This is completely wrong. Here is the two, two put packs. That's, this is not guaranteed to work. So the shift function is the actually consuming function. I'm not sure if maybe I should call it consume. I'm not sure. I mean, shift is such a nice technically established term. This will still be true. So we do not allow consuming more than eight bits at a time, which makes sense because eight is also the, the guarantee, the, what we guarantee as a look ahead. Yeah, this, this will change because yeah, this will remain the same. It's just that then we will have bits and bits. <coughs> Otherwise, this will remain the same. This, this will be different. Because, <coughs> sorry. Actually, <coughs> what we care about is if um, the number of, <coughs> sorry, this should be bits and available minus bit. <clears throat> if this is less than eight, that's the case we want to rectify by fetching more from. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> In this case, we need to fetch. Here we must <coughs> actually be careful because this could become negative here. Actually, in this case, if this is so, let's let's get shift to the other side here. If you're already less than eight, then there is no point in, in trying to fetch something from the stream. So we could even say that if <coughs> So this, this means um, we need to get um, we need to get the next byte from the stream in order to satisfy 
in order to provide an 8-bit look ahead. <coughs> yeah, this I mean this remains the same. That's fine. Uh, the first part here also remains the same. Uh, the second part. <coughs> Side. So 8 plus shift is greater than this, <coughs> that means that this will be a positive number. Yeah, and that's fine because the next byte will be shifted at least by one. So at least one of its bits will, will reach into the 8-bit look-ahead region. Extreme case would be that this is zero. Then we would actually already consume shift bits from the next byte. Yeah, that's also fine. Here we use maybe get character, which um, which actually returns zero in case of end of file. And now the only thing we need to check is did we actually get a byte from the stream? And we can check it like this. So is if if the buffer pointer is larger than the or let's write it like this if s buff is smaller than s pointer, then we know we did actually get we did actually get a byte so maybe we could actually combine these two code paths Mm. 
Mm, oh no, that doesn't really work well because here we would remove the shift. No, I think it's fine like this. And yeah. Yeah, that's that's actually yeah, that's nice because that's the same condition as for putting back. And here we have at least eight. Yeah, we have at least eight. There could be some consumed and then, yeah, then we don't put back actually if not eight remain. So that would be fine, the end of stream ending. Yeah, I think that would be it. So the peak, 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 peak. That remains exactly the same. That's a super fast inline function. That would be even simpler. Let's actually make the changes right now because I want to see if, if we can get things working. Skip the byte boundary. This means that um, this means that we throw away we throw away partially consumed bytes. We can only have one partially consumed byte. We cannot have 16 available bits, but we could have exactly eight. So the only case where we have, the only case where we don't have a partially consumed bytes is if, if n available bits is either zero or eight. So we actually need to look at the modulo, so modulo eight, available bits modulo eight. So, so this would be an available Well, let's write modulo A, this may be clearer. It's unsigned anyway, so it's the same for the compiler. Modulo eight. So that's the that's the remaining bits. Then we just shift the reservoir by this amount. Right, and we reduce the number of available bits by this amount, which means it will become a multiple of eight, which can be zero or eight. So that we could assert this here is this is zero, all bits and available bits is eight. In this case, if it's eight, we have something to put back into the stream. A 
Okay, yeah, here we actually see that, that this is an awkward definition because this becomes easier, stays the same. Oh, here we, we actually also do the get character. So here we can drop this. Yeah, this is, I think we need to revisit this. I'm not sure, especially this part here. This does not really handle end of stream. Okay, and that's it. Uh, that that is so. This one is a bit fishy. This one. But for trying out, I think we can actually live without that for now. So let's change all of this. So we for sure we'll get some errors where the NAVAIL is used outside the data stream bit source. Is this really the only one? I'm surprised. Surprising. So does anything still work? I think that, I mean, the test PDF parser probably did not use this at all. I think I saw some things passing here. I mean, one general design question is, of course, should something like the data stream bit source that provides the individual bits that are not by design, should this be incorporated into the data stream itself or not? And so far, I think I want to keep it separate because first, it's only, it's only used in, in quite 
quite local pieces of the code. So currently I think it's only used for the Huffman uh, decoding in JB2. And we might want to have different variants of these bit sources that have longer look ahead, for example, and different semantics at end of stream and so on. So I'm not sure that I, I don't think I want to incorporate this into the data stream system directly. I think even for register allocation in the compiler, it's probably better than it is a small separate struct that can be more easily optimized away. So maybe I should write that down as reasons for keeping this separate. So let's see, rational for keeping this separate from data stream. Use of bit sources is rather local. And having this as a separate small struct may help register allocation. Also have um, other variants of bit sources. I don't know why I type so badly today. I'm a bit tired, I guess. Also in a later want to have other variants of bit sources with different amounts of look ahead or different semantics at end of stream. And I think that these are good enough reasons for keeping this separate. The price to pay is additional arguments to, to functions, but as, as it is used rather locally, it's not passed around too much. I, think. I mean, it is passed around to some degree. I don't count these inline functions because they are all inline and optimized anyway. But we do pass it around a bit between them maybe three or four functions that are involved in the Huffman coding, but that's not too much. Okay, so the tests are still passing. That's great. And now let's see if we can actually pass, pass one of them that we did not pass before because of the problem with the bit source. I hope this was the only problem, the bit source here. So let's try the 11. Let's actually start with the 11 so this is faster. Wow, OBS is all cooking my CPU again, I think. So uh, let's start with 11 here. <clears throat> By the way, I have a, a safety measure for forgetting this kind of stuff because that's very dangerous. If you skip some unit tests, you can easily forget to, to re-enable the other ones, but I have that's the reason why I test the number of tests at the end here and I will not modify this number now. So we will see a fail because of that. But I cannot forget to change the spec this way. So 
So that's that looks very good because we have one check failed, but this is the check for the num. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> oh no, it's not because this was aborted. That's not so good. So okay, I need to look into that in more depth. I think it's a different error than the one I got before. So, but let's let's try the other one. There's another one where I suspect that the bit sources are the problem. So 27. It would be nice if at least one of them worked now. Oh, we still run into the unexpected end of screen. This is actually not a nice context report because it, it appears to show data after the end of the screen. So that is something that that is something that should be modified to make clear that either the, there's actually no data left or the data is left, but it does not belong to the substream that we are in because the, the limited substream has actually zero bytes left as it reports here. So we are decoding one of the Ellie McBeal pictures here. We reach exactly the end of the Huffman data. I would like, let's look at in the debugger. Let's look where this happens. Let's look at that. So, Let's fire up Remedy. We need the JBIG2 test. So let's get rid of the breakpoints. We only want one breakpoint and this we want in probably in the fail reporting somewhere maybe in the in the fail here function that would probably be a nice place so where are we let's see if this is the yeah, it's the 27, the test that we suspect to fail. That's fine. Um, we fail. Ah, this is exactly the fishy function that we were looking at before. But where, where are we getting this? Okay, we are looking for, we are looking for the end of, the end of stream marker. Ah, that's an interesting case because we calculated before that we actually do have 24 bits left. So, and still we are failing. That's interesting. Let's look at that again.
Okay, um, I think at first I need to disable this breakpoint. And first wait for the wait for the twenty seven here. So let's break here, but only if we have test i equal twenty seven. Yeah, and now we can enable this breakpoint okay so let's see how many bits have we calculated that we have left four okay then how could we ever get inside here don't get inside Now we should have zero bits left. Oh, wait. There is something not, not quite right here. So let's look again. We have a bits reservoir. We have 12 bits available currently. So what does the stream say? Stream is not even close to its end. Are we maybe not in the segment where the problem happens? Probably we are not in the segment where the problem happens. So let's continue once, twice, three times, four times. Yeah, now we are very close to the end of the stream. Four times. Four bit planes, probably. For 16 levels of gray, that could match. So now we are, we are actually two bytes. We have two bytes until the end of the stream. What does the bit source say? The bit source has 12 bits left. Um, M bytes left is two, that looks correct. And bits left is 28. Yeah, the, I mean, that's what I would expect, right? And actually we have the zero there. Zero, zero. So we have eight. Yeah, this actually looks like an end marker at the beginning because we have, I think 11 zero bits, 11 zero bits and one 
one bit. What are the next bits in the screen? It looks like a zero here. So let's send this to the memory view. Zero, zero, one, zero. That looks very much like that's really an end mark, I think. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. Yeah, that looks like an end marker, a correct one, correct end marker. So this will be zero. Now we extract the end marker. 24 bits from the bit stream. We have 28 left. That should be no problem. But we fail. Okay, there is something wrong in this function. There is something wrong. So let's restart. So first one, second one, third one, fourth one. That's the one that makes the problems, I think. Are we close to the end yet? No, not yet. It must be the next one. Yeah, this one it is. This one is close to the end. So. Prefix length zero, value length is twenty four. Available bits minus prefix length. We have twelve bits available in the in the reservoir. So, six, eight, nine, yeah, that's fine. While n twelve is less than value than plus eight, y plus eight. The plus eight here is wrong, I think. Yeah, the problem is, you see that the, the idea was that we want to, afterwards, we want to be sure we want to be sure that we can afterwards we want to be sure that we can have eight eight bits look ahead left but we cannot guarantee this at the end of stream so actually It's only an error if we fail to fill up the value length. We can try to get more look ahead afterwards, but we shouldn't fail if we don't get it. So
So what we should do, I think what we should do here is we should only try to fill up to value length. If we don't get the data here, it's definitely not right because we cannot fill up the, the number of bits that we want to extract. So this plus eight is actually fine because we use eight extra bits in the accumulator, I think. Um, so n is smaller than value length. So this n is smaller than value length. So value length minus n is positive, and then we add eight more. So that's at least nine. We shift at least by nine. We shift at least by nine. And every time we shift less, less. So we're adding the bytes like this. The last one is shifted at least by nine. That means if we add a, another one, if we add another one, it is shifted at least by one. That's fine. And here we should actually, so now we know that we have, we have enough in the buffer for value length. But if we don't, don't have enough for the look ahead that we want to provide to the following code, then we should maybe we try to get we try to get more from the stream we shift by at least one bit here right so yeah at least one bit So here we know that n is n is value length n is at least value length at this point If it is exactly value length, then this will be eight. And this we should only do if we actually got something from the buffer. from the stream. I think now it's correct. It's not a nice algorithm, of course, so we leave the speed annotation here. This is not 
not pretty what we are doing here, but I hope it's at least correct now. So n is less than a try to uh, fetch another byte to satisfy the 8-bit look ahead of the consuming value len bits. And here we really try, so we do maybe get character. This does not fail when we reach end of stream. It will, would just return zero. And here we check if we actually got something or not. I think, okay, I must exit remedy so we can make something. So I'm really curious if this will work now. That looks good because we are actually continuing after 27. That looks quite good. In the end, we will fail because of the number of tests, but that should be the only one, the only check failing. Why does this not work? works so yeah this is way really too slow this test but i think we have another another conformance test stream passed correctly i guess and let's see if we got ellie mcpeel did we get Ellie McBeal out of this stuff? Yeah, we have one atomic bill here, but I, I should have removed the old. I should have removed the old ones before. <laughs> the neck position, yeah. <laughs> My neck position is not the best. That is true. So. Uh, 
that looks good the only check we failed is the one for the number of tests that means it should mean that we can parse Ellie McBeal now the second Ellie McBeal actually but let's run it again and first I remove all the old images and let's see what we get why don't I we have one Elimac wheel. I don't get this. I don't get it. What is going on? Because I thought we started with 27. Shouldn't 27? 27 should be the first uh, uh, the second Ellie McBeal we should get two Ellie McBeals at the end right because they should be tests 20 26 and 27 And I would expect them to come out as test files. Why don't they? Oh, because this is probably not the only test I'm running. So let's make it the only test I'm running. let's use a test filter and how is this test called it's called something with this strange name so let's look yeah we have an Ellie McBeal we have an Ellie McBeal, people. That is great. We have we are seeing Ellie McBeal from the 90s because we have implemented an image format from the 1990s. And people at the time really liked Ellie McBeal. And actually, if we start with 26, we should see two Ellie McBeals. One encoded using Huffman coding and one encoded using arithmetic coding. And yeah, I should probably do something about my neck position because it's I'm feeling the strain when I when I stream for a longer time. I think it's it's actually worse when I'm streaming because when I'm coding on my own, I'm moving around much more and I'm leaning back more and not um, so it's. It is a bit um, emphasized by streaming. But yeah, I don't I don't really have a nice setup currently here. So 
So uh, this is this is working. So this means that at least this part of our design review was a success that actually translated to better code. I think I will take this as a good opportunity to end the stream on a high. Let's quickly clean up the mess that we made. This is gone. So we reviewed the design. Uh, do we want to always keep at least one part in the rest of our yeah, do you need post contest about being able to put back the byte into the data stream? Um, not really. <laughs> what we do need is you're not so while you have a data stream bit source going on, you're not allowed to do anything else with that stream. I should make a note about that. So document restrictions. On user code while it is using a bit source. So this is clarified. That's a next test that always be called by this next. So that is fine. Um, this is actually gone. This whole stuff is gone. This is so put it back into the data stream. That's all fine. Uh, we I think we will keep the shift because it's um, with regards to bits. It's just. Uh, a very common thing to say that we shift. Mm. Yeah, I'm quite happy this this code this all became much cleaner. More confidence in the correctness of this code now. This is still an ugly algorithm, but at least it's correct now. So we have this one fail, but this will soon be gone because we revert, we will revert the test back to the correct number of tests. And actually, I also want to test once again, if maybe we, maybe we pass the number 11 now. Probably not, but let's try. That would be too great to pass two additional tests. That would be so great. Too great to be true, no, this this one we do not pass yet. So this is this is work that still needs to be done. So let's see, we pass one test more now. We have two Ellie McBeals. Our progress is measured in Ellie McBeals.
So while this is running, let's take a look at our to-do list. Did we did we Yeah, this is something that we can do now, but I won't do it today, I'm too tired, but this should be possible now to achieve this. Otherwise, we have a lot of questions from today's review. A few decisions. Some still to do. So this is done. This is to do. This is to do. Yeah, this is done, but the backwards parsing I still need to work. That's currently a mess. So this is to do. And this is done. Yeah, we sleep over the the design questions and maybe I'm wiser tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>